Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Leontine, and I'm presenting something that I did during my master's at York. Um, during my master's, I worked, uh, I did a work placement at the Archaeology Data Service, which is a digital archive that holds archaeological data. Um, the, and one of their biggest collections is their grey literature reports. Uh, these are um, from contract-led um, archaeology work and uh, there's a huge variety. So we've got uh, marine archaeology, we've got um, <coughs> specialist reports, watching briefs, exca full excavations, there's everything in there basically. Um, but uh, the library, you can only search for the library with the metadata that's provided by depositors. So sometimes you get very nice metadata. So this is a lovely example where finds and monuments are documented by the depositor. Um, however, sometimes depositors fill in for or fill in terms such as archaeology, <laughs> which is not fa uh, very useful. Um, also, I decided to work with a subfield in archaeology uh, to archaeology, um, and that adds another layer of interest because the controlled vocabulary used by the ADS to uh, add this metadata to the report um, is very limited, very broad. So for sea archaeologists, animal bone is the only term that will show up in the library. So if you are interested in, say, cattle or rats, um, you will be, you will have to look through all these reports tagged as animal bone. Um, so this led me to uh, see what natural language processing could offer um, these, the, these reports. Um, however, someone suggested to me, why don't you just do a full text search? Really easy, you know, problem solved. Um, however, it's not that easy. Um, there's two problems with it. One of them being <coughs> that archaeological data is really complicated. So archaeologists have a tendency to tell all these little stories at the start or summarize different sites in the areas, um, and it leads to a lot of false positives. These are uh, small <coughs> abstracts from just random archaeological reports, um, and all the purple underlined terms are false positives. So basically, they're terms that will show up if you would do a full text search. Um, but they actually are not relevant to the research. So for example, in the middle, we have white horse stone assemblage. This is not the assemblage that the, that report actually uh, talks about. Um, another one is, which a Sioux archeologist pointed out to me, is that he was really interested in rodents. Um, however, there's a lot of terms related to rodents. Um, this word cloud was created from the Wikipedia page for rodents um, and just shows the most popular terms for it. Um, so if you would do a full text search, you would be expecting uh, to be looking for all these terms, which is <laughs> a lot of work. Um, so this led to uh, basically seeing what natural language processing could offer. Um, so natural language processing is a branch of artificial intelligence that deals with interaction between computers and humans using the natural language. The ultimate objective of NLP is to read, decipher, understand, and make sense of the human languages in a manner, manner that is valuable. Um, so basically, you, the computer starts to understand our, our language. Um, I'm not the first to do this in archaeology, as Alex is also working on this for Dutch archaeological reports. And previously, uh, there's been other projects that have dealt with this, uh, within um, STAR and Stellar and the Ariadne project. Um, however, all of these um, uh, tools were rule-based. So rule-based is um, where you, as a human, write the rules for the computer or for the, for the tagging. So just to give an example of it, um, we have found birds. So this is all pseudocode, it will actually not work. Um, so if the term bird is found, then the tag is true. 
And then another example would be, we have not found birds. And if that would be found listed term not in the sentence, then you could tag it as false. Um, but you can understand that if we go back to this complicated false positive data, um, that's a lot of rules you will be writing <laughs> and a lot of variations. Um, so that doesn't really work. Um, so instead of using rule-based, we decided to use machine learning because it offers a lot more flexibility because we will not be writing the rules, but the machine will be learning uh, from it and tagging it. Um, another thing is the relevancy to archaeologists. So um, a lot of these tools are created in isolation without a lot of input from archaeologists and that leads to tools that are not very useful basically. Um, so we decided to set up more of an interdisciplinary team. So we have two computer scientists, someone from the ADS, a Sioux archaeologist and me and I kind of was like this intermediate pers person that could translate what the limitations were from a computer scientist point of view, but also translate what the Sioux archaeologist actually <coughs> wanted to something that the computer scientist could understand. Um, and another thing is linked data, um, which is good. Uh, and, most, <laughs> and most projects, you and old projects have used it. Um, but as I pointed out before, um, it's not granular enough for the Sioux archaeological data. So we decided on using the Encyclopedia of Life. And their goal is to um, tag all species in the whole world. So it's great because there's a lot of data in it and a, and a good ontology. Um, also, uh, within machine learning, there's deep neural networks. Um, and this is the, um, the <coughs> method that we decided on using. Um, so just to give like a brief explanation of what it actually is. Um, this is, so on the left hand side, we've got an input. In the middle, we've got a node. And on the right hand side, we've got an output. Basically, there's a threshold value in the node. Uh, if your input goes over that threshold value, your output will be positive. If it doesn't, it's negative. Um, this is just a neural network. A deep neural network has multiple nodes in the middle called hidden layers. And um, I just really quickly wanted to show the one that we built. Um, so I'm not going to go into huge detail into this, but I do want to point out a few things. At the bottom, there's a layer um, with EMB on it. The, these are all word embeddings. So we as a human are able to distinguish, distinguish that before bold uh, as, <laughs> as example. Um, <laughs> Uh, as example, a car would be closer related to, say, a bus than a car is to a flower. A computer is not able to do that, but with the help of word embeddings, um, it's, it's, it gets a better context of what's happening. Um, the two layers in the middle, the units, uh, stand for long-term, short-term memory. Um, this is a model introduced in 2015 in the computer science. Uh, field and basically it gives um, the option of having a lot of data in between that's not relevant. So for example, an archaeological report could have a tag, say cattle, at the start of it and somewhere, say in the middle of the report, but all that data in between is basically noise and not, uh, not relevant um, and a lot of uh, models before this um, find that really difficult to handle that like absence of, of data in between. Um, so this like offers an option of, of uh, dealing with that. Um, but why use a deep neural network? Um, it's a complicated thing to build. Uh, it takes a long time to train. Um, however, within archaeology, as most of you know, uh, we've got small data sets, um, small complicated data sets with noise in them um, and um, this deep neural network can offer can work with a really small data set that's complicated and still give good results so that's basically what we want um, just to, so now we've got this shiny model that we have to have to put data into um, 
So we created annotated Sioux archaeological data. We did it by um, picking five Sioux archaeological reports. So we didn't just pick random excavation reports. We specifically picked Sioux archaeological reports. And we did that because then we would have more tags. Um, then it's annotated by two people. Uh, this is really important because if you as one person would be tagging it, it could become very subjective. Um, and then these two taggings, our two uh, tagged reports, are checked by a super annotator for discrepancies between the annotators. Our super annotator in our project was the Sioux archaeologist, because um, he was the most knowledgeable on Sioux archaeological data. Um, the reports that were tagged had to be translated to XML because a machine can't read color coded Word documents. Would be great, but it doesn't. Um, and then this XML was ready to be imported into the neural network. Um, this is just to give you an idea of what the tags look like. So on the right hand side you have the color codes, in the middle you have the name within the Encyclopedia of Life, and on the left hand side it's the identifier within the Encyclopedia of Life. Um, and the tagging was done within Gate, because um, it gives a nice interface for doing it. Um, this is something that computer scientists love. This is the F measure. Um, <laughs> this is, so when working with computer scientists, they really, really like this measure. It basically measures the accuracy of the tool. Um, but <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't answer that question of relevancy. But I just wanted to point out that our computer scientists uh, the, the one at the bottom, the EBLCM, that's, that's our neural network. The one above it is conditional random fields, which is another type of machine learning. Um, and they just really like it that this tool is performing better than conditional random fields. <laughs> However, it really doesn't answer this question. Well, is it relevant to archaeologists? Um, so because we had a Sioux archaeologist in the whole process, with us, um, we kept asking him what he wanted <laughs> and what he, you know, how he would want to use this data. Um, and at the e at the end, we decided to set up kind of a prototype interface to give him an idea of what would be possible. Um, so for this, we took all the reports from the ADS. Um, we also decided just to include all the PDF reports um, within the. Um, within the library. So we got about 110,000 reports. Um, then we did some pre-processing. Um, that was the tagging of the reports. It went into the neural network and then we merged it with the metadata that was already existing in the library um, and that led to a database. We first had this great idea where we would do like the, the um, the running of the neural network on the fly. So if you would type something in, it would start running. Then we find out it took 23 hours and no one really wants to wait 23 hours for the results. So we decided to put it into a database. Um, but if the neural network was to be updated or if annotated data would be updated, um, of course we will update, rerun the neural network and update the database. Uh, so I think this should work. Yeah, it does. Um, just to give you a really quick idea of what the interface is like, um, so you can select an animal um, and you can also type in the Latin name if you're really interested in doing that. Um, and um, so as example, if you pick horse and you search, uh, you will see um, on the side all the metadata that is from the ADS library. And on the right hand side, you will see the reports that we extracted. Um, and then if you um, <coughs> click on the uh, term horse, it will take you into the Encyclopedia of Life, um, which is the ontology that we use for tagging. Um, this will give you some extra information on it. Uh, you can also go into the name, so that will give you all the synonyms that, that you have. And at the bottom of this, there's also um, the taxonomy. So what family it belongs to and the, um, that whole kind of hierarchy. Um, the 
So we decided to incorporate this taxonomy into our uh, system. So um, yeah, this is just the example of it. Um, so if you go back to the search, sorry, I, I pre-filmed it. So <laughs> um, you can also see that one of the families within a horse is the mammal. Um, so if you go back to your interface and you were to type in um, mammal, you also um, get all the um, terms within that family. Um, so uh, mammals, field mice, sheep, horse, everything like that. So we use that link data or, and that ontology to create this. We didn't do this manually. Um, yeah. um, just to point out some feature work, um, the one thing with this deep neural network that is a bit negative is that um, it can only tag, it will only find terms that have been tagged in the annotated data. So it, it is limited in that way. Um, however, uh, it is flexible. It's a very flexible tool. So it's not created only for archaeological data. You could give it any annotated text data. Um, at the moment, at the ADS, they're seeing if it could be incorporated into their system. So their current ADS library system to see if they could tag more stuff when these reports come in, uh, which is very positive because this interface is a very bespoke system and you don't just want it to disappear, basically. Um, and another interesting thing is that at the moment I'm doing a collaborative PhD at uh, UCL and the National Archives. And uh, um, the National Archives are also very interested in seeing what this tool could offer them. So that's archival material instead of archaeological material. Um, now, that was me. Thank you for listening. And uh, are there any questions? Mm -hmm.